Hi, and welcome to another FinTech Search Advanced Team Conversation today with Shane Shin, founding partner at Shuru Partners. Uh, Shane co-leads the firm, a leading seed stage VC in the Middle East, North Africa, and Pakistan. Today's discussion will explore what Shane sees as being around in FinTech in this region and the next hot trend. Handing over now to today's moderator, John Lillywhite. Thanks, Anita. Shane, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, My pleasure. So I... I thought we'd start with a humble brag on your website, which is FinTech Investor of the Year 2019, recognized by Forbes Middle East as part of the 20 VCs in the Middle East, top 10 in the UAE and number one in Abu Dhabi um, for your work at Sharouk. So I guess to begin, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, how you ended up in the UAE and, and, and kind of what Sharouk Partners does? Uh, it's really my pleasure and thank you for having me and uh, giving, giving us this opportunity. So quick background, me, uh, myself born and grew up in South Korea. Uh, I grew up in Korea, I went to high school in Canada because of back then I thought about being a musician so I played the piano and the clarinet throughout my life. But I soon realized, you know, I'm not the Asian prodigy, Asian Mozart of our generation. So I transitioned from music to business, went to the World to School in the US, concentrating in finance and minoring in Chinese which really led me to start my investment banking career at TD Securities, Lazar Ferris and Company. And then I moved to a private equity firm in San Francisco. So there I specialized in LBO of uh, software companies, platform companies, which was a great experience. Uh, uh, but for me, I've always wanted to do something related to emerging market. You know, perhaps similar to all of us, right? I love the region. I believe in the potentials here. That's how I joined. That's how I joined the Global Foundries and Mubadala, a frontier tech team where you are investing in semis, right? You are investing in probably the most advanced human tech uh, around the globe, particularly in China, India, Europe, US, but still never in our region. So uh, I wanted to do investing in the Middle East, but because I was not getting that exposure, my partner, Mahmoud, we were working together in Mubadala. I would say, look, our passion and the purpose is to find the best founders, entrepreneurs from the Middle East, and let's help them when they need us the most. And this is how we founded Shurok in 2016. Alhamdulillah, in the last uh, four years and a half, we have become the leading seed stage VC. We specialize in seed, pre-seed, pre-series A, series A. We like to lead all of our rounds, particularly in fintech, platform, and software. So fintech, about half of our company's uh, investments are related to fintech. We love this space. And we have been investing since 2017, so earlier than any other uh, players. Right, uh, our headquarters is in Abu Dhabi, but we have office in Dubai, Saudi, Bahrain, and soon open one in Egypt. So we're very excited uh, with our presence and growth. Well, thanks for that introduction. So I wasn't aware actually. So a lot of your first experience, kind of mapping the scene here and and and, and getting you know a foot into Abu Dhabi and understanding how things work was at Mubadala, is that correct? Yes, Mubadala is a subsidiary global foundry. So Mubadala was 100% and Mubadala back then used to invest in semis through a global foundry, so yes. Mm. And, and for background, for, for those listening, you know, Mubadala is, is well, one of the, the largest, I, I suppose, investment funds in the Middle East, if, if not the world. I'm guessing, Shane, you can probably provide a little bit of context on, on what they do better than I can. Yeah, so, so Mubadala, I think today there are $250 billion plus uh, uh, asset under management investment firm, like uh, one of the best uh, globally in terms of investment style, strategies, reputation, brand equity. Uh, like uh, They really are, let's say, top-notch globally. I personally learned a lot. There are many different sectors. There's a real estate team, infrastructure team, technology mm -hmm. team, metals and mining. Uh, I mean, it has already been several years, so many things probably have changed here and there. But uh, I, uh, like my partner, Mamu, he spent, uh, I think, about 10 years in Mubadala. So like he, he really is an expert. I personally only have a greater sense of appreciation for global founders in Mubadala, where they brought me, where so they supported me to make this ultimate journey of the Middle East happen from dream to reality. And uh, it has been the, like, the best of friends uh, Mubadala today uh, is our, one of our LPs to our second fund. So we're also extremely blessed by this partnership. Great. So what happened when you made the jump? When you made the jump, 
you know, from working there to, you know, partnering, finding partner, building a team, jumping into Sharuk. Were you worried about it or, or was this something that you knew you wanted to do? Did you have a game plan? Because as you said, you know, at that time back in 2017, um, this is still something that was a little bit new. Yeah. So I personally have never been worried about my parents' work. So the biggest uh, discussion I had to do was uh, how can I, <laughs> uh, like I had to convince them why am I leaving Utopia, which is San Francisco, right? Remember, this is 2015. <laughs> of course, right. Everyone was talking about Utopia of San Francisco, like Uber, DoorDash, so many public companies, so many sexy yeah. tech companies were just popular. And I, I was telling them, I'm going to leave all that to the one-man shop with Mahmoud in the desert, right? Uh, so it was a great uh, discussion. Personally, I, I never regretted it. I, I'm so blessed right. to have found this Shuruk at the right time. You know, if you think about what we do, like a lot of it is depend on the right time. And uh, I wanted to found Shuruk before late. If I found the Shuruk, let's say now or next year, I don't believe we were able to differentiate this fast or this much, right? but because we have been one of the early players, especially on the seed stage, the early stage, and we branded ourselves at the leading seed stage. Like uh, now we see we see more than 2000 companies a year and we invest in only about 10. So I'm gonna ask the great uh, journey so far. Yeah, and it seems that process of selecting companies in particular, you guys have, have the, the, the way you've selected companies has is, is been very interesting. And I guess that's something we can, we can talk about later because, because a lot of your selections have, have worked out and you know, not, not, not all incubators or VC funds have, have that kind of success ratio. Um, so we can go into that a little bit, but I wanted to start really talking a bit about kind of FinTech um, because you know, this is FinTech Surge and a little bit you know, given your experience in financial markets, you know, um, in the United States and here, but w why is, is it you think fintech in particular is such a growth area here in the UAE and everywhere? And why do you think it's becoming so prevalent? And, and what kind of, what, what do you, what are the hot sectors that people are also looking at? So kind of to mm. begin with, just a quick overview of your interest in yeah. fintech and why it's something that really seems to drive you. So uh, we have been focusing on fintech, but fintech is still a big word, right? Uh, anything yeah. related to payments these days can be a fintech. Uh, remittance, mm -hmm. obviously, blockchain can also be a fintech. There's just a lot. But, uh, but overall, since 2017, we have been interested in fintech because I consider that as an infrastructure uh, thesis, right? So if you think about our region, the early 2010 to 2015, we saw huge appetite for platform businesses like e-commerce, ride sharing. E-commerce still popular even to this day, right? And once those uh, e-commerce starts to be popular, what follows that? Like a last mile delivery, all the logistics players, they start to be developed. And once that develops, what follows that? Payments, the COD issue that is prevalent in our region. You know, how can the credit cards issue? Credit cards are actually a very vast space. There's issuer side, acquirer side. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, different uh, mechanics and flow of funds you need to understand. So we were interested in the FinTech because by the 2016, when we found the Shuruk, we knew that e-commerce was already a red ocean. I might see uh, e-commerce for baby products or e-commerce for plants, e-commerce for something. But as an investment firm, we were our own DNA and culture. We were just less excited about that particular thesis. We were more excited about how can we benefit as a, from the infrastructure level. So we started with the B2C focused fintech companies like Sarwa, which now is becoming, uh, has become the leading robo advisor wealth management platform the whole region. Right, that we have right. been back in those this early stage like a seed round when there was the two founders with a vision, they had a great idea, like a not proven market, but proven business model, yet this is extremely difficult to make it work in our region. So we worked hard. I really respect uh, the Sarawak founders who did that. Smart Crowd, crowdfunded for real estate. That's another great B2C FinTech company we have backed. But now these days we back more on the infrastructure B2B level FinTechs, Lean, which is open banking movement from Saudi, which also is quite, uh, quite popular in UAE, Bahrain, and et cetera. Nimcart, which is uh, like a marquita of the region. Like they're on issues processor side that enables B2B clients to 
uh, uh, create your own uh, credit cards, right? So like we love, we're get, getting deeper and deeper into the level, but overall FinTech uh, is it, a vast world. Uh, there are certain segments we mm -hmm. like. And uh, to respond to your last question, what are the subsectors within FinTech that investors are quite keen? Uh, a few months ago, uh, there were a lot of a BNPL, buy now, pay later companies who raised uh, a lot of capital, like uh, Tabbit, Spotty, Pay Now. Uh, we, we like all of the founders in those uh, companies, we respect them. Sure, we personally did not invest in them, but we have a bigger thesis on lending, especially on SME Sharia compliant lending. So we invest in a company mm -hmm. called Lendo out of Saudi, which is an SME invoice factoring. We love that model. We are leading another company out of Egypt. We cannot disclose that now because we're just finalizing the, the docs, but it's a reverse right. invoice factoring right. out of Egypt. So like uh, we, we like this special form of lending and that we have been backing. And I believe as the, as the our economy opens up and grows, SME is there the backbone, especially in our region. I think about 80% of our economy is done by the SMEs. So how can we provide credit to SME? How can we provide, facilitate easier lending, working capital side to the SMEs? We love that thesis. So we have been backing them hard uh, so the, for the last uh, several months. Wow, so there's a lot there, but I think one of the main things I pick up on is you keep using this word thesis, which in a, in a way is is encouraging and really interesting because there is, um, sometimes a worry that, you know, um, investments have been pushed by buzzwords or by, or by hype or by being led by what's happening in Silicon Valley. But this idea of developing a thesis of where the market is going to go and then testing it and, and, and basing investments on analysis and the kind of understanding of where the ecosystem is. So as you, as you described, you had that kind of e-commerce revolution that happened relatively quickly. Um, but there was also a lot of infrastructure and a lot of services that can be built off of that and on top of that. There, there were a lot more things to build. So what you're really saying is that um, you and your team do come up with a thesis. You study the markets, you look at the yes. technology, and then that kind of guides your investing principles. Yeah, so we use the word thesis-driven sourcing. So TBS, right? Uh, okay. uh, at the end, uh, many established VCs, including us, uh, we, we're not short of a deal flow, actually. Like uh, we get, uh, I told you, we see really more than 2,000 companies a year. And out of that, we invest in about 10 companies. So let's say 0 0.3, 0.5% max we invest per year. So we're not short of a deal flow, but over the last uh, four years and a half, we have invested close to 60, 60 investments. We have invested a bit more than 30 companies uh, the best companies that we like and we're a big fan of, I mean, we're a fan of every company, but the, where we got most excited is when we identify the thesis earlier than the founders reach out to us, we search, mm -hmm. source, and uh, like a strike mm -hmm. the partnership with them is the best, right? And uh, we, when we sprint on the TDS, for example, recently we had a TDS on gaming and entertainment. We talked to 120 companies in the segment in the region. We create a flyer, we put post in LinkedIn, and we try to talk to every single player that falls into that, create our own uh, map of the, how the thesis uh, works. And we identify the biggest important value chain and we try to invest in them, if it makes sense, right? So uh, this that is what makes we sense. do. Yeah. Uh, for FinTech, we try wow. to do something similar. Right? So, so before we go into some of your individual investments with a focus on FinTech, what you just said is, is really interesting because alongside the discussion on e-commerce and how that boomed and how fintech boomed is an associated discussion that I, I've had some with some friends and colleagues here is, is the growth of VC in the Middle East and GCC in, in particular. Because if you look at the growth of the technology industry in Silicon Valley, VC always played a massive role. It's part of the history alongside perhaps R&D in the universities, which is another discussion you have here. But there's, there's this argument that VC in the region until really the past five to six years was often family based, didn't often have the, the infrastructure and the KPIs and could sometimes be based on a gut feeling or contacts or kind of network or, or a sense that yes, this industry needs a solution. 
but there wasn't that idea of a thesis. There wasn't that an idea of, okay, you know, we're looking for a, a gaming company that can fit into the, to the, to, to some of the problems we want to solve in that way. So just from your perspective, I know, you know, you've worked at Mubadala, which is, which is at the very high level, but do you think VC generally is becoming more sophisticated in the UAE, in the GCC, Saudi Arabia and UAE, particularly because it's having to look at technologies like FinTech, which can be quite technical and complicated and involve quite mm -hmm. a lot of due diligence? Yeah, I, I definitely believe so. Like, uh, I don't have to talk about other VCs. I'll tell you today, we're so much smarter than last year and so much sm hmm. infinitely smarter than 2016. Like, Interesting. Uh, we always try to be humble. Like Shuruk was founded by Mahmoud right. and Shein, who had a limited experience compared to like, we didn't have 30 years of experience. We didn't have a white hair. Mm. And we still don't have white hair. Right? So, so like uh, we were always uh, uh, learning from the founders. We use the word founders partners because we learn from them as much as they learn from us, hopefully, right? <laughs> and uh, we are growing fast and uh, we, we try to really sprint and learn with humble mindset, not only from the founders here, from the global standards. And part of Kaufman Fellows, I went to work I went to Stanford. We have a, we're not short of a good friends globally who are in this space. So we talk to them a lot. We bring them for our startups in the region. And we try to bring our startups outside uh, for them. All right, so all those uh, network relationship experience we're learning and by human being, if you work hard, you should, you should be growing. So we're very uh, disciplined on the growth and we work tirelessly. Like I personally, we work like 6.5 days a week. So like we, mm -hmm. we really have a lot of pride on the work ethic. So in short answer, yes, we are definitely getting better. Uh, everyone, I'm sure in the ecosystem, we want to be a part of that leading front runners to impact and influence and lead the ecosystem. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for that. Yeah, it does seem that rapid learning is taking place, particularly in VC, but also in FinTech. So. What, what is really good about the conversation today is if we go through some of the companies you guys invested in, it actually also gives a, a relatively good first introduction to the fintech space here in the UAE and, and GCC more generally. So I wanted to start with Sawa because it's probably one of the companies that, that is more recognized. Um, and basically, you know, they, they've been accepted into the DIFC Fintech Hive Accelerator pro program. Um, but but what do they do and, and kind of what was the innovative aspect there that, that kind of yes. caught your eye relatively early on? So, so just to explain the business model of what robo advisory wealth management means, right? Uh, th there is a select group of people who tend to be wealthy. They have access to professional fund managers. It can be a fund manager like us. It can be a fund manager at a bank for private wealth managers and et cetera. So they get active advice on where to invest like stocks or bonds or ETFs or like real estate. However, most people, especially the younger millennial, younger generation, we do not have a millions of dollars that we need to get attention by those wealth managers. And also a lot of us do not know how to do active investing. For example, I have been blessed because I have been investing in stocks when I was, uh, I think, 15 years old. But not everyone is interested in stocks, so they don't know how to open a stock brokerage account. Then it's the only option of uh, accumulating profit rate or interest rate at a bank. That's not the best option. You might get 2%, you might get something, but like, there are many other better options. You know, Warren Buffett has proven that passive investing beats frankly, any other active hedge fund managers or uh, portfolio managers over the long term. This is the beauty of a passive investment. So Sarwa, when they came up with this concept in the region, you know, we have a lot of young people, a lot of growing people who are busy, who do not know how to do active investing, who have some wealth. It doesn't have to be a lot of wealth, that's the key. Right? You just actually need a few thousand dollars to start the account. Now Sarwa actually, uh, uh, took out the minimum uh, account fee. So there's no minimum account to open an account. All right, so Sarwa's whole model is they want to use algorithm and uh, evaluate your risk appetite profile and provide your risk adjusted preference investing through passive ETFs. So ETF is a good, is, I don't know if people are familiar with it, 
one ETF can hold like thousands of stocks. So it's a lot risk adjusted and uh, it is passive by default, but Sarwa actually even use a portfolio of ETFs to even do a further diversification. So this is the whole beauty and we love that thesis. We knew this will work. Back then, as you mentioned, FinTech Kaya, but this was their very first uh, sandbox license, innovation testing license for Sarwa. Right? And the second company was SmartCrowd, which also is our portfolio company. And when mm. Sarwa was uh, uh, coming up with this idea, uh, the regulation had to be revised. There's a lot of uh, a hurdles that had to happen. But uh, we saw that the founders, uh, Mark, Chad, and Nadine, they had the hustle and passion to disrupt this. And uh, now, I mean, the rest is history. They have been disrupting. They have been growing. We're adding, we're adding more and more capital per, per month. We're also adding B2B capital. So there's a lot of uh, good momentum. And they recently announced a trading. You know, like uh, what's after investing through a passive? Some people do want to invest actively. And I think we'll also provide a trading platform on top of that. Right. And I think that gives a pretty interesting insight into what you do, but also the, the, the elements of the industry here. So what does it feel like investing in a company like Sawa when you believe in them, when you've, you've seen the numbers, you've seen the strategy, but in the back of your mind, you also know that they're kind of ahead of the regulations, you know, and, you know, you've spent yeah. a couple of years here in the UAE, but what did that feel like when you're investing in a company and you know, wow, you know, yeah. national regulation really has to change for this to work. So, so um, I think if everyone, every investor says, uh, oh, we knew it, uh, frankly, no one really knows what's gonna <laughs> happen, right? So we just try our best and uh, pray inshallah all the time. So what we can do is uh, we need to have the strong friendship and partnership among the founders and the investors, which is the partners. And we really need to be hustled and uh, work with the regulators the fortunately, and I can really say this with confidence, UAE, like a TIFC regulators, ADGM, uh, Hub 71 regulators, so FSRA, uh, Bahrain, Saudi. Like, uh, frankly, our region, we're, I, I believe we're blessed with the regulators who want to work with the startups. You know, US, which is a capital market driven, I, I would be surprised if the regulators are so willing to work with the, uh, uh, the founders. Perhaps that's because they're already very capital market, so they tend to could be more efficient or risk uh, risk taking. But however, I, what I do know and I felt it since the beginning is uh, our regulators they have the right uh, approach on working with the startups, working with the investors, and if we can prove to them why this is beneficial for the ecosystem and we can save protect man on the street, like uh, uh, they're increasingly accommodative. Right, and uh, this has been a crux of our fintech thesis. The founders of a fintech companies are different from the founders of another e-commerce. It's not that one is better than the other, it's just very different skill set. I believe uh, you need to have a different type of uh, communication, different type of articulation, different type of focus. Right? So, uh, 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 and this is how we think. Yeah, and, and that's something I've definitely seen in my work, you know, the role of the the public sector or the you know government as well and and um you know free zones in in making some of this change possible and in a way you know countries like this can be slightly more agile than bigger cap capital markets like london and the united states where you know change can, can take a lot longer um but so so moving on from that you also mentioned smart crowd which is is real estate investing uh which again might might be interesting to, to our yeah. listeners how did that one work so, so it is a crowdfunding for real estate, but what's the biggest issue with the real estate? Hey, you first need like uh, at least uh, $300,000 of uh, capital, like a lump sum capital, mm -hmm. which not everyone has. And second, once you invest, uh, you're locked in for let's say several years. It's not like a stock where I buy today and uh, try to sell it next week. All right, so a smart crowd is an innovative concept of crowdfunding for real estate investment. So I don't have $300,000, I can invest with $1,000, I can invest with $5,000, and I get a fraction of ownership of that property, right? And the smart crowd, they are the leading one. Uh, I believe they've done already more than 40 transactions. Uh, and they, I personally invested in seven, seven or eight real estate properties through them. And, uh, but I never really put more than like 10,000 dirhams. So I'm embarrassed to admit, like I put small amounts and I invested multiple times. 
And I remember <laughs> I was the very first uh, beta customer for a smart crowd when they were coming up with this idea because we led their seed round. We led the seed round of Sarwa as well. And then uh, like they see uh, and we speak the founders of smart crowd, also absolute hustlers. They've been growing extremely well. Yeah, well, given that you see invested in them, I'm sure they'll forgive you for not, for not <laughs> investing in all those properties. I think they should, they should be all right with that. In, uh, close to 100,000 dirhams or so. I, I think uh, yeah. I, I love, because I know that the yield I get from a smart crowd is much, much higher than a bank. I, I just, uh, right. and, and uh, what it gives me comfort is that a company like smart crowd and Starla, there are so many talented individuals working behind the scenes to create value for our capital and their capital as well. Uh, so I know that's the case. So I'm happy to put there more than frankly, like my bank account, right? My bank account is money just sitting there, right? <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Um, I think both those case studies give kind of good insight into, into some of what you're working on. I've, I've got uh, one in particular though, I was, I was really interested in. I mean, that just, just, for listeners, we've got um, Kazna, I think I'm pronounced that right, Financial Services, which is an Arabic-based website. Yes. I think that's based in Egypt. Um, so, you know, you're not just working in the GCC. You have um, companies yeah. in Egypt and Pakistan, I believe, as well. Sure. But but one, one I wanted to go into a lot more is NIMCARD, which sounds just really interesting and, and was something I wanted to learn more about, where, where you can instantly create, control, and distribute virtual or physical cards you can, yeah. using an API. This means that other fintech startups, large enterprises or banks in the MENA region can have the building blocks for fast and easy card programs. So if you have uh, a fintech application, you can build in some yes. kind of card, virtual or physical card infrastructure. I can instantly yeah. see how that would be, uh, you know, um, a, a multiplier for a lot of what a fintech startups are doing. Give, can you give us some background on that and tell us why it's exciting? No, I mean, you already explained so perfectly. So I, I don't know how I can explain. So uh, FinTech is really a hot sector now and there's so many great FinTech companies uh, being formed. However, still uh, the, the nature of FinTech, you need a lot of partnerships, sometimes with the regulators, sometimes with actually the traditional banks uh, and, and the issuing a card like uh, there's really no way right. uh, around it other than going through the traditional banks, you know, and how right. conservative the banks can be. A massive problem, so right massive problem, that reason, yeah. Uh, so the right. banks, then they look at you as a startup and founder and say, what, what do you have? Why do I need to give you the card? Right. Like I have, like, mm. uh, it's just not their priority, right? So now with the NIM card, with our, like with its own sponsorship, with its own like a partnership with the Visa and MasterCard, we actually can issue it can be the issue and help you create your own specific cards. So that's why we use the word infrastructure. It's not a mobile wallet. Mobile wallet, the customer facing UI, UX, mm. very beautiful app. They can work with the NIM card to create cards specific for that company. Not only FinTechs, like we have a company like Trucker, which is the leading uh, mobile aggregator, not mobile, like a leading aggregator for uh, trucks, the supply chain logistics side. They work with thousands and thousands of truck drivers, right? Instead of paying them in cash, now we can issue them a fleet card, like a fuel card through a NIM card. So the potential is limited, right? All the last mile deliveries, now they can also issue a card like that they can use to pay fuel, they can use to buy stuff. They also collect data. They also know where this money is being used. Like there's just so much uh, use cases uh, more than yeah. just the uh, creating a card, you know? Mm. No, it's super cool. I mean, yeah, you know, you described this pain point where existing SMEs can very rarely get access to credit cards or even banking cards. I've heard stories about several founders in, in you know, the Middle East using their personal cards for transactions and then debiting it back to the country, to the company, uh, excuse me. But yeah, also, as you said, you know, if there's emerging companies in the fintech space or in other emerging technologies that can easily access these kind of, of, of facilities, that's a massive force multiplier, not just for that specific industry, but for everyone really who's working in, in emerging tech. So, so NIMCARD, you know, really does give a sense of, you know, how, how fintech is, is, is starting to reshape some of what's possible if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an innovator. Um, 
but yeah, so and so I've got I've just got two more companies that 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 kind of gives some insight in, into how this space is changing as well. Another is lean technologies. Yes. So again, they're using that word infrastructure to provide access to consumer financial data. And I know data is of course something very important. I know it's yeah. something that governments care about a lot, but also financial institutions care about a lot. And the idea that APIs abstract developers away from the complexities of the financial ecosystem, uh, there needs to be a focus on the consumer. So the idea of impact driven entrepreneurs and technologists on a mission to enable the next generation of financial innovation for consumers in the Middle East. That is a bit abstract. So, so what is Lean Technologies trying to achieve? Yeah, so it, it, when I use my app, right? Uh, uh, and as if I need uh, info from my bank, normally I press my, uh, I go out of the app, I go to my Emirates MBD bank that I use. I, I, I need the info that I need to retrieve. And then I come back to my app I put it in. So there is a lot of friction. Like uh, each one of this, frankly, is a friction. And uh, for especially for fintechs and e-commerce and a lot of them, they lose customers by these. I personally hate to go through this uh, friction. So in a very simple use case of Lean, which they should do a lot more. And the best company to look for in the US is called Plat, uh, which is about, I think, a 7 billion plus uh, company now. It might be more than that. Like they make seamless integration that you don't have to leave your app. It can be cream, it can be whatever, right? And you don't leave your app and uh, it already is integrated through the open banking with your bank, uh, let's say info and the accounts. Europe is extremely uh, open banking friendly. Our region, uh, I think we're just taking baby steps. I believe this is also the future, right? Uh, uh, banks are also getting more and more innovative, which is a great thing. Right. So uh, this is a very simple and clean use case of what Lean does. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And the, the open banking stuff is interesting as well. Uh, and then just finally, so uh, on the B2B end, Capita, which brings together wholesalers and merchants on one platform, um, allowing them to order products through an e-commerce checkout and also receive credit on their purchases. Um, that's focused on Egypt's $100 billion market um, and has over 500,000 underserved merchants. Um, in basic terms, though, what is the problem Capita is trying to solve um, yes. and, and why is it being successful? So there are two big problems that the Capita is solving. So uh, the mom and pop bakalas or the small supermarkets that is very common in the, in the whole region, including uh, Pakistan, they, when they order their supplies from the wholesalers or distributors or brands directly, you know, they normally use the WhatsApp still. They call or they use WhatsApp. I buy sugar from this distributor. I buy Coke from this uh, wholesaler. I buy something from this. Capital wants to aggregate all of that and disrupt the supply chain. So this is what we call B2B wholesale FMCG. So they mm. serve the mom and papa colors, the, the supermarkets. And uh, because they aggregate the demand, they can also get a better pricing when they buy from the wholesalers or brands. And they also provide the logistics support. The reason Capital is also a great FinTech company is they should provide credit to those mom and pops. You know, those small businesses or small SM, the, the Pakalas, they always buy in cash. When I when right. I get my product, I pay in cash, you know. And uh, frankly, for them, fifty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars, all count. They would love to get at least a few days of credit. Then I can buy more, and I can use my working capital efficiently. Capital provides that to the mom and papa colors, and this is a really a secret sauce. This is a competitive industry, so I don't know. Saying this uh, is good for capital because many other businesses are competing in the industry, but capital absolutely crushing it. We have been extremely blessed to be part of their journey. They're growing a little bit too fast. Like I'm ne we've never seen a growth in this region and we cannot disclose the actual number, but I'm confident they're one of the highest uh, uh, metrics in the whole, in the whole region. And uh, the, there is a huge market demand and part of their value prop is this FinTech angle. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, entering the, the Egyptian market um, 
isn't always easy, but if you enter it at the right point and in the right way, um, it's not surprising that, 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 you know, a company can scale and, and deliver a service at, at, at that kind of volume. Um, but, but again, you know, it might not have been possible even five years ago. Um, so, so just to run through very quickly, some of these other companies, we've got a Clara company formation service, um, a company called Clara you've invested in, which allows individuals to very quickly form digital companies in the Cayman Islands and ADGM, uh, health monitoring, Spry Health, which allows organizations to identify early signs of clinical deterioration, uh, Repso, blockchain-based sales tracking, so that's a bit more of, of, of you know, supply chain logistics, Monchon, which is, is quite popular with a lot of my friends, and even uh, Voz, which is 360 events and, and, and broadcast channels. I guess, you know, when, when we, we zoom out of all of this and look at it all from a, from a bird's eye view, there, there's on the one hand the, the, the thesis or, or the decision-making structure with which you identify your investments, um, which, which seems to be working out you know, pretty well. But, but more broadly than that, it seems to be that Sharuk is positioning itself for the future, for the fourth industrial revolution and for how the economy and things like health, logistics, um, wholesale, yeah. banking, are, are working. Is that really also part of your thesis, predicting what the future of the economy is and positioning uh, yourselves to accelerate it and take advantage of it? I think that's the only way for us to be the best investment firm. Like, uh, uh, and frankly, there's no secret sauce to it. Uh, uh, there is a many different ways to make an investment. There are many ways to monetize your investment, but for Shuruk, we have a grand vision we have for the next 40 years. I want to be the oldest Asian man standing in the Middle East, right? Uh, <laughs> so we have a 40 year journey. We're just uh, in four years uh, into it. We have a 36 years to go, right? And for us to continue to innovate as an early stage fund, especially as a seed stage fund, I need to think uh, frankly earlier than others. And that's not easy. Right, the, I think the hardest part from our job, and this is where we spend a lot of time to discuss, negotiate within us, the team, challenge each other. Like, uh, what is the new sector? Like, where should it be? If we're in the current sector, what is the differentiator point today, but more than three years, five years? How can we make sure this company is doing well in the next five years? It can be a great company today, but in two years, the regulation change, it might actually struggle, right? So like, uh, that is part of our job, but it's never easy. This is why we try our best to only recruit the A plus talents uh, within the team. And we're very proud to have built a strong team. We're international, uh, we're, we're well diverse, and we also value those diversity. So uh, this is a very, uh, this is definitely what we're trying to achieve, uh, John. Well, thanks for that. So just to conclude today, kind of what are your, what are your hopes and plans for the following year? What are the opportunities you're, you're looking for yeah. and the kind of things you're trying to achieve? So uh, we, we are investing out of our second fund, Bidai Fund. And uh, we, want, we, alhamdulillah has been, we have been doing quite well with that. We want to launch our third fund, also the same strategy, like a same strategy, just double clicking, triple clicking on what we do the best. Uh, so like we're always, if you have any good founders, if you're a good founder with amazing idea, looking for a partner, reach out to us. We love to talk to you. We love what we do. I want to be the first uh, call when you have bad news to share or good news to share. Right? So we want to repeat what we're doing the best and uh, double click, triple click. We also want to make sure everyone stays healthy and safe, like uh, still a turbulent uh, period. And I want the best for our founders, right? Our founders this year, next year, uh, it is a critical year for all of us. Like uh, this type of uh, turbulence actually creates opportunity if we're ready. So like I want, I'm, I'm confident that the, the teams that we have backed, the teams that we'll build together are the right teams are the winning team. And uh, that's why uh, I'm only excited as the time grows, right? Well, Shane Shen, thank you for your time today. All the best for the future and I hope to thank talk you to guys. you again soon. Thank you. Thanks thank you everyone. Bye-bye.